A man comes to the emergency room with, ah, my back, my testicles. Ah, oh, yeah, what's, oh, I got flank pain, flank pain going down into the testicles, into the scrotum. Hey, oh, What's the next best step in the management of this patient? Oh. You know what a lot of medical students say? They go, you're an alpha. Strain the urine. A man comes in with, ah! Some medical student comes by and says, can you pee into this cup? Pee into this cup? Can you pee into this cup? Can you pee into this cup? Let's get you on a sonogram schedule for next Tuesday. So the first thing to do is pain medications, Ketorolac, Toradol, pain medications, analgesics. You're going to like kidney stones because basically it follows a cookbook, which is during acute renal colic, the most important thing is analgesics. I like fluids, I like a urinalysis, I like a sonogram, but you know what's more important? Analgesics. This is bad pain. You know what's in the Hippocratic Oath? Kidney stones are so old and so well known that Hippocrates said, I will not practice surgery, not even for the stone. That's how bad kidney stones were. It's as old as the ancient Greeks. The single most accurate test is a CT scan, but remember you don't need contrast for the CT scan for kidney stones. This is the single most accurate test. The IVP is never done. X-rays are not done. X-rays are the wrong answer, wrong answer, wrong answer. X-rays of the abdomen are good for ileus, for small bowel obstruction. That's it. Okay, so I have a stone. Now the next thing to do is to make sure that you don't have hypercalcemia, you don't have hyperparathyroidism, and you don't have a correctable cause of that kidney stone. Now let's see. The man has one single episode of renal colic. It's single, it's brief, it's self-limited. He has no hydronephrosis, no obstruction, and he has a two centimeter stone in his renal pelvis for one single episode that's brief, self-limited. He's got no hydronephrosis, no obstruction. What do you do next in the management of this patient for this one single episode of renal colic that is brief, self-limited, and resolves. It's got a two centimeter stone in that renal pelvis, but no complications. The kidney is fine, there's no obstruction. What do you do? The most common wrong answer is to say, wait for it to pass. Wait for it to pass is wrong. Wait for it to pass is wrong because most people don't get that a two centimeter stone will never pass because the most that passes is five millimeters. 90% of stones that are less than five millimeters, you can wait for them to pass. But a two centimeter stone How's a two centimeter stone going to make it through your urethra? Two centimeters through your urethra? Wait, wait, here it is. It's coming. Hold it. Hold it. It's coming. Here comes the stone. Oh, look. The penis. It's 90% effaced and fully dilated. <laughs> oh, look, you gave birth to a little stone. So you'll never be able to pass a stone <coughs> that big. Stones that are above two or three centimeters actually needs surgery. We don't do much open surgery. You actually put a lithotripter or cut it out from the side. Here, lithotripsy, between five millimeters and two, three centimeters, lithotripsy. So stones that are above five millimeters won't pass without help. Borderline stones, ones that are between five and seven millimeters. Here's something new in the last 20 years. We can use tamsulosin 
which is an alpha blocker, and nifedipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. And when you could use tamsulosin and nifedipine, which is an alpha blocker and a calcium channel blocker, for alpha blockers and calcium channel type blockers to be able to help these stones go through. It's like a stone episiotomy, borderline, give a little extra push. However, remember, stones that are gonna pass spontaneously have to be under five millimeters. If they're really big, like two or three centimeters, they're never gonna go out, even with lithotripsy, because really big stones, I mean, two centimeters is a huge stone. The pieces get stuck later on. Last thing is this. If you have a stone that is from a person who over-secretes calcium, over-secretors of calcium are treated with thiazides. Over-secretors of calcium in the long term, because that's the most common cause of kidney stones. The most common cause of kidney stones is familiar, familial hypercalciuria. People who just secrete increased amounts of calcium, and we don't know why. Familial, normal calcium, hypercalciuria, thiazides pull calcium out of the urine. So therefore, we can use thiazides to pull calcium the same way that an adverse effect of thiazides is that it can cause hypercalcemia. An adverse effect of thiazides is hypercalcemia. But we can take advantage of that by using it to pull calcium out of the urine to make it so you're less likely to form stones. And because it desaturates the urine. Last piece has nothing to do with kidney stones. Kidney stones, best initial therapy, analgesics. Most accurate test, CT scan without contrast. Even if you have a single brief episode, stones that are under five millimeters will pass, stones that are over five millimeters remote, the borderline ones will pass with tamsulosin and nifedipine. I strongly suspect this is the most frequent question you're gonna get this time of the year. Really big stones, you can't even use lithotripsy because the pieces will crumble and get caught later on. Last point for this section, stress incontinence and urge incontinence. Urge incontinence is very similar to what we talk about in multiple sclerosis, which is that hyperactive bladder, too much acetylcholine, use oxybutynin, tolterodine, oxybutynin, tolterodine, trospium, darafenacin, solafenacin, and these are anti-acetylcholine drugs. And if the question is not clear of whether it's urge incontinence, the big issue is pain. Urge incontinence causes sudden bladder pain. It's very physically uncomfortable. People feel that they know every bathroom between in their commute. When they're walking down the block, they know where every bathroom is because the bladder all of a sudden decides that it's having a seizure. It's like Prinz Metal's bladder and you gotta go or you're gonna wet yourself right there. It's really a devastating and uncomfortable disorder. A lot of us don't think about it so much because you don't die from it, right? But for patients, it's a disaster. If you're not clear about it, about whether or not it's the diagnosis, we can actually do bladder manometry. Bladder manometry is you actually put a pressure transducer into the bladder and it will tell you if your bladder is hyperactive. So bladder manometry, anticholinergics, they won't want you to say do behavior modification prior to using the anticholinergics. They'll want you to say, why don't you try some exercises like behavior modification to increase your duration between urinations. It's very uncomfortable, it doesn't work super well. Bladder manometry to confirm the diagnosis, antiacetylcholine medications. Stress incontinence is easier to distinguish because stress incontinence does not have pain. Urge incontinence has pain. Stress incontinence does not. Stress incontinence is people who are just leaky and they get leaky, especially in association with coughing or laughing and the increased abdominal pressure makes you leak out urine. No pain, but you get leaky. So the first thing you're supposed to do is Kegel exercises 
If you don't know what they are, I think you should learn about them. Everybody should do Kegel exercises. Kegel. Do them with a friend. That was a, me strengthening my perineum, my perineal muscles. And then before you do surgery, did you know that estrogen creams, did you know that estrogen might strengthen up your distal urethra? Did you know that the distal urethra has estrogen receptors? You can grow up the epithelium with estrogen. Estrogen creams can grow up the epithelium with estrogen. And that basically, the distal third of the urethra is under estrogen control. It's kind of like fertilizer, like miracle grow for the, uh, for the epithelium or your distal urethra. It doesn't work great. Kegel exercise to strengthen your perineal muscles estrogen cream, and ultimately surgery for stress incontinence. Now, incontinence is not a, in women is not a huge knowledge base. The first thing is, is there pain versus no pain? The second thing is behavior modification first for everybody. The last thing is there's not much medical therapy for stress incontinence. There's tons of medical therapy for urge incontinence. Tons because lots of people have it, and why wouldn't you want to be part of that market, right? See you in the next section.